We've been studying the book of Daniel when I've been up here uh, speaking. And I hope people have begun to see that the book of Daniel and the prophecies in them are really all one prophecy. Just each one uses different symbolism and is really the history of the world. And today we're going to look at Daniel chapter 7. But before we do that, um, I want to review Daniel 2 and the dream that Nebuchadnezzar uh, saw. And in his dream, he saw this statue and it had different features to it in terms of different metals. And each metal represented a kingdom. The head of gold represented Babylon, which was uh, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. The chest and arms of silver, uh, we found out, represents Medo-Persia. We found that, that out by studying the book of Daniel chapter 5 and seeing the story of the writing on the wall. And then the belly and the thighs of brass is Greece. And the legs of iron is Rome with two phases, uh, one being pagan, which is continual, or in, in most Bibles, uh, daily, with the word sacrifice added. And the second phase being the papal phase, which is the transgression of desolation mentioned in uh, Daniel 8. And then we have the feet of clay and iron, partly strong and partly broken. We're not quite sure what that's about yet. We'll, we'll probably look into that today. And then the stone cut out of the mountain that destroys the image. What is that about? What does that represent? So let's continue our study to determine what the rest of Nebuchadnezzar's dream means by looking at chapter 7 in the book of Daniel. So I invite that you to turn with me to Daniel 7, and we're going to look at these first three verses that uh, Rick read for us. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. It means he was in bed sleeping and he had this vision. Then he wrote the dream and told us some of his matters. He recorded what he had dreamed. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now, what is meant by this term, the great sea? Let's see what the Bible has to say about this, this term, sea. If we turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and verse 15, it tells us what the interpretation of waters or the sea is. In verse 15 it says, and he says to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So this, this verse tells us that the four great beasts came up from among different peoples, nations, and tongues, but they were different from one another. Verse 4 of Daniel 7 says, The first beast that came up was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth. And it was made to stand up on, upon the feet as a man and, had, and a man's heart was given to it. So the first uh, beast was like a island, uh, lion with eagle's wings. But later on, it had its wings plucked off and then became as a man upon the earth and a man's heart was given to it. We'll talk about what this means a little bit later on. Continuing on to the next verse in Daniel 7, 5. And behold, another beast, a second, like a bear, and it raised itself up on one side and had three ribs in his mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said... Thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. The next verse, Daniel uh, 7, verse 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And then the last beast of Daniel 
7, and verse 7 is this. After this, I saw the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the other beasts that was before it, and it had ten horns. Notice all the other beasts were animals that we know of in the earth. The lion, the bear, and the leopard, they all represent something. But this fourth beast, there was nothing on the earth to describe it. So it was this, described as a dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. And so it's, and it had ten horns. And it was different from all of the other beasts that were before it. Well, let's learn a little bit more about this beast here. In Daniel 7, 8, it says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Little horn. We've talked about a little horn before, haven't we? In Daniel 8, chapter 8. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold... In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Continuing on his vision, he says, and, beheld, and I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came out from before him, and thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. So Daniel's having a dream of these beasts coming up from the sea, and this fourth beast was different than the rest, and it had ten horns, and had one little horn come up that did away with, with three of the ten horns. And now he's seen in his vision, the throne of God was set in place. And the throne was like a fiery flame, his wheels as a burning fire. If you look at the book of Ezekiel, you see this is part of the description of God's throne in the book of Ezekiel. And the reason for this happening is the judgment was set and the books were open. Now, what, is, what are these books that were opened? There's so many directions to go in this prophecy. I'm going to try to limit, but I, I want to address this just a little bit. When you look at Matthew 12 and look at verses 36 and 37, it says this, But I say to you that every idle word, whatever men may speak, they shall give account of it, in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Now here in Daniel 7, we see in verse 10 that the judgment is set and the books are opened. These books are records of our lives, of our deeds, our thoughts, our words that come out of our, our, our mouths. And during judgment, these books are going to be looked at. Listen to what uh, Malachi 3.16 says. Then those fearing Jehovah spoke together, each man to his neighbor, and Jehovah listened and heard. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared Jehovah and for those who esteemed his name. So are there, there are books in heaven that record the events and the words and the actions of, of humans on this earth. Revelation 3, 5 says this, The one who overcomes, this one will be clothed in white clothing, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So these are some of the texts that talk about these books that are open here in Daniel 7, and there's others as well. Um, but let's continue with this vision that Daniel's seen, seen when he's asleep on his bed at night. 
I beheld then, because of a voice of the great words which the horn spoke, talking about this little horn. He's kind of interrupted in his vision of things as he's looking at this uh, vision of a judgment and the books being opened. He hears this voice of, a, of the little horn, which is speaking great words. And I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Remember, we have four beasts here in Daniel. We have the lion, we have the bear, we have the leopard, and we have this, this horrible beast, this terrible beast mentioned as the fourth beast. And out of this fourth beast came these ten horns, and out of the, among the ten horns came up this little horn who, who spoke great words. And Daniel sees this fourth beast, which in the end represents this little horn that came up until it was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame until the end of the age, until the end of the world. The other beast, each in their order, each in their time period they have dominion, they had it taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. These beasts represent different kingdoms. And those kingdoms, the residue of those kingdoms were lived for a prolonged period of, of time, for a season and time. Yet this fourth beast, it is slain and destroyed. There's nothing that continues in it. Continuing with the vision in verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions and beheld one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Okay, let's, let's look at the sequence of events here. Okay, first four beasts rise up out of the sea. The sea represents nations, peoples, and tongues. And now this fourth beast are ten horns, and now among the horns grows up this one little horn. And then Daniel sees in this vision the thrones were set in place. Judgment has started. The books are open. And then during this scene where the, he's observing the, this process of judgment and the opening of the books, he hears this voice, the little horn speaking, speaking great things. And then next, in the night vision, after the beast is destroyed, is one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven. And he can't, he's not coming to the earth. Notice Christ is not coming to the earth here. He's, he comes before the Ancient of Days. And they bring him before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. I invite you to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 19. And we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 15. Luke 19, verses 10 through 15, starting out with verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This nobleman went to a far country to see, receive a kingdom, and after he received the kingdom, then he returned. And he calls his ten servants and delivers them ten pounds and says unto them, Occupy until I come. 
But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given money that he they might know how much every man had gained by trading. Jesus is talking about himself here. He's gone away after his crucifixion and resurrection. He's gone away and he will eventually receive a kingdom. And that's what Daniel is talking about here in Daniel 7. He's receiving the kingdom. And then once he receives the kingdom, then he returns to this earth. Then Christ comes again to this earth. Okay, so who are these four beasts? These beasts of Revelation, Daniel, uh, these beasts of Daniel 7. And what relevance do they have for the vision? Does this vision have for us today? What does it mean to us today? Well, let's start with the lion. Isn't it interesting that Daniel 7 continues on with Daniel receives the, the interpretation of the vision that he saw when he was asleep. Starting with verse 15 of Daniel 7. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me. He made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. For the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. But wait a minute. Aren't all the other visions that we study in Daniel about the kingdoms of the world? But this vision covers the same ground. Why is it given to him again? Because with each vision, each interpretation, we learn more knowledge about what events are to happen in the world. And so here in Daniel 7, we're going to learn more things about this vision that apply to this world we live in, to the day that we live in, and to the future that's yet to come. Remember, the lion had eagle's wings, denoting the rep, how fast he, Babylon extended his conquest under, under Nebuchadnezzar. At a point in the vision, a change has taken place. Its wings have been plucked. It no longer flew like an eagle upon its prey. The boldness and spirit of the lion were gone. A man's heart, weak and timid and faint, had taken its place. Such was emphatically the case with the nation during the closing years of the history of Babylon, when it became enfeebled and through wealth and luxury, and, the, and that of the bear, that it raised itself up on one side. Remember the kingdom that conquered Babylon with Medo-Persia? In Daniel chapter 8, we learned that the ram with two horns represented the, the kingdoms of Medo-Persia, and Persia, and one came up higher and stronger than the other. And the same with this bear. The bear was raised up on one side, and that one kingdom was stronger than the other. And, this, and the bear is fulfilled by the Persian division of the kingdom, which came up last, but attained the higher eminence, becoming the controlling influence in the nation. The three ribs perhaps signify the three provinces of Babylon, Lydia and Egypt, which were especially ground down and oppressed by this power. This kingdom dated from the overflow of Babylon by Cyrus. Remember, we, we looked at the prophecy of Cyrus in the book of Isaiah from B.C. 538 and continued to the Battle of Arbella in B.C. 331, a period of 207 years. Grisa is represented by the symbol of the leopard. If wings upon the lions were talked about the speed of their conquest, 
then this would be the same indication here with the uh, kingdom of Greece. Remember that Alexander the Great conquered the world faster than anybody else. Nothing has, no other kingdom has done such. There's no other parallel in history. Could you continue to scroll down? So the conquest of Grisha under Alexander has no parallel in history for suddenness and, ra and how rapid it was. But who is this fourth beast? Daniel 7, verses 19 through 20. Then I would know the truth of this fourth beast, which was diverse or different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nail of brass, which devoured the breaking pieces and stamped with residue with his feet. Remember that image of Nebuchadnezzar, that the legs were made of iron and represented the kingdom of Rome, the Roman Empire. Verse 20 here in Daniel 7. And the ten horns that were on his head and of the others which came up and before whom fell three, even of that horn that had eyes and the mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Remember that this Roman kingdom had two phases that we learned about in Daniel chapter 8. The initial phase is the pagan phase. The second phase is this little horn, the papal phase. Look at what Daniel 7.20 has to say here. The ten, ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up, which is referring to the little horn before whom three fell, that the horn had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Let's keep reading about this. How was the pagan part of the Roman Empire overthrown? It was by the barbarian tribes that invaded and conquered the Roman Empire. This is the first or pagan phase of, of Rome. And let's look at some history of these tribes and who these tribes were and what they were about. There were the Huns, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Vandals, the Suvi, the Burgundians, the Hurliuli, the Anglo-Saxons, and the Lombards. These are the ten horns of the beast that's represented in Daniel's prophecy. But three of them are done away with by this little horn. Who are they and why were they done away with? Let's look at the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbon. I've never read the book. I understand it's very thick and takes a while to read. Odasser, the leader of the Hurli was the first of the barbarians who reigned over Rome. He took the throne of Italy, according to Gibbon, of his, in uh, AD 476. Of his religious beliefs, Gibbon says, like the rest of the barbarians, he had been instructed in the Arian heresy. But he revered the monastic and episcopal characters and the silence of the Catholics attested the toleration which they enjoyed. We'll talk more about what this means, Arian or Arianism, in a minute. But even though he didn't believe as the Catholics did, as the papal power did, he respected them, so he didn't persecute them. He tolerated them. Again, the author of this book says, the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Suvi, and the Vandals who had listened to the eloquence of the Latin 
clergy preferred the more intelligible lessons of their domestic teachers, and that Arianism was adopted as the national faith of the warlike converts who were seated on the ruins of the Western Empire. This irre irreconcilable difference of religion was a perpetual source of jealousy and hatred, and the reproach of barbarian was embittered by the more odious epithet of heretic. What I find interesting about this quote that they preferred the more intelligible lessons of the domestic teachers. Remember in one of the prophecies we've, we've studied the past month is that this little horn would have a language that was difficult to understand. It was part of the prophecy. And here it is right here. So what is Gibbon referring to as Arianism? What is he talking about? Well, let's, let's go here to where everybody goes, to the internet for in information. Arianism is a non-Trinitarian Christological, Christological is the study of Christ, doctrine which asserts the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who is begotten by God the Father at a point in time. A creature distinct, and these aren't my words, this is just what this definition is. A, a creature distinct from the Father is therefore subordinate to him, but, it's the son of, but the Son is also God. Arian teachings were first attributed to Arius, a Christian presbyter in the Alexandria of Egypt. The nature of Arius' teaching and his supporters were opposed to the theological views by, held by Homonism Christians, which is the Catholic Church, regarding the nature of the Trinity and the nature of Christ. The Arian concept of Christ is based on the belief that the Son of God did not always exist, but was begotten within the time by God the Father. So what is the central doctrine of the papal power? Let's see what what uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. This is taken from the papal website. And these are two sections. The, the sections of the Catechism is, is numbered. And we're, we're going to look at number 234 and 261. The mystery of the most holy trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God in himself. It is therefore the source of all the other mysteries of faith, the light that enlightens them. It is the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of the truths of faith. In section 261, it says, the mystery of the most holy trinity is the central mystery of the Christian faith and the Christian life. God alone can make it known to us by revealing himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you see the conflict between these two beliefs? So much so they would persecute and attempt to destroy each other. It wasn't just the papal persecuting the Arians. It was Arians persecuting the papal beliefs as well. It was a dual process going on here. So who were the three kings that were humbled or destroyed? Well, the Herluli were destroyed in 493 AD, the Vandals in 534 AD, and the Ostrogoths in 553 AD. But the effect of opposition of the Ostrogoths to the decree of Justinian, however, is to be noted, ceased when they were driven from Rome by Belarus in 538 AD. Let me just um, read a little bit of history from the book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Well, the Catholics were thus feeling the restraining power of an Arian king in Italy. They were suffering violent persecution from the Arian vandals in Africa. A gentleman, Eliot, 
who wrote um, an apocalyptic um, book in volume three, page 152, notes this. The Vandal Kings were not only Arians, but persecutors of the Catholics in Sardinia and Corsica under the Roman Episcate. We may presume as well as in Africa. Such was the position of affairs when in 533 AD, Justinian entered upon his Vandal and Gothic Wars, wishing to secure the influence of the Pope and the Catholic power, party. He issued that memorable decree that was to constitute the Pope the head of all churches, and from the carrying out of which in 538 AD, the period of papal supremacy is to be dated. And whoever will read the history of the African campaign from 533 to 534 and the Italian campaign from 534 to 538 AD will notice that the Catholics everywhere hailed as deliverers the army of Valerius, the general of Justinian. Whereas evidently the prophecy of verses 24 and 25 refers not to his civil power, but to his power to domineer over the minds and consciences of men. And the Pope reached this position, as will hereafter appear in AD 538. And the plucking up of the three horns took place before this to make way for this very exaltation to spiritual domination. Why only these three horns? Because we read that there was others that were erring in belief as well because the others were converted to the papal spiritual beliefs through its policy and crowd. It was interesting that these other Barian tribes who in, invaded Rome, even though they conquered pagan Rome, they were spiritually conquered and converted to the Catholic belief of the Trinity. This is the separation of belief in, in God and the Son of God, or believe in the, the Trinity. That's what these wars were about. And just as Daniel 7 predicts, three of these kings or kingdoms were humbled and destroyed by this little horn, which is the second phase of the Roman kingdom. Continuing on in Daniel 7, 21 and 22, and I beheld that the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are the ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So what are some of the characteristics of this little horn power? As you can see this depiction of the little horn on this beast, this fourth beast of Daniel 7. Let's look at them. And he shall speak great things against the Most High. Who is the Most High? Is that that God in heaven above? And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. This is interesting because the papacy is a religion, yet he shall wear out the saints of God and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. For the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Now I just want to briefly, just briefly talk about this period of time at the end of Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. They shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. What does that mean? Well, if you look at the Jewish calendar, Daniel is a Jew. He's in captivity in Babylon, and so his reference in time is in relation to the Jewish calendar. There are 360 days in the Jewish calendar. 
So a time is one year, times is two years, and the dividing of time is a half a year. And so we come up with 1260 days. That's how long the prophecy is for. As we saw in our earlier slide that the beginning of the papal reign is in 538 AD. And so 1260 years after that brings us to 1798. And history tells us that in 1798, Berthier, a general of the French army, went to Rome and took captive the Pope. And so that's when this phase of the prophecy ended. So let's continue on in Daniel here. Look more at these characteristics of the little horn. And he shall break and he shall speak great words against the most high, against God. Let's see what he says. This is a, a quote from Stephen Canan. He um, actually is the author of one of the older catechisms of the Catholic Church from the 1600s. Even with those who do not know the rules of discussion and whose minds are imbued with something like honest fairness, controversy will be endless if the scripture alone be appealed to. He's talking about how to talk to people that have different beliefs than the Catholic Church. That divine book does not and cannot explain itself. Can you believe that? How do you know the truth of God's word except by having the Bible interpret itself? And accordingly, each disputant will interpret to suit its own views. Of course, that's always possible. Hence, the bitter discussions and interminable contradictions observable among all those sects who have separated themselves from the Catholic Church. Let's go on. This is from the Catechism. Do you observe other necessary truth as taught by the church, not clearly laid down in scriptures? What do they teach as truth? The doctrine of the Trinity, a doctrine of knowledge of which is certainly essential to salvation, but is not explicitly and evidently laid down in scripture in the Protestant sense of private interpretation. How does he speak things against the Most High? This is from Pope Pius X. The Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself. Under the veil of the flesh and who by means of being common to humanity continues his ministry among men. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. What does the word antichrist mean? It doesn't mean against Christ. It means putting oneself in place of Christ. And that's what's happening here. Pope Pius the V, the Pope and God are the same. So he has all power in heaven and earth. Pope Innocent III, we may, according to the fullness of our power, dispose of the law and dispense above the law. Those whom the Pope of Rome does separate, it is not a man that separates them, but God. For the Pope holds the place on earth, not simply a man, but the, of the very true God. Does the little horn speak against the Most High? Most definitely does. Referring to the great apostasy, this is Pope Francis, the current Pope. The Pope said that of the life of Christian goes ahead, notwithstanding these two persecutions, urging the faithful to be careful, not to fall into the spirit of the world. Pope Francis assures us of his closeness 
I will be with you, he says. What does Matthew 28, 20 say? Teaching, this is Christ speaking, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He's claiming to be Christ here. Okay, the little horn was giving power to war against the saints and overcome them. Scott's church history says no computation can reach the numbers who have been put to death in different ways on account of their maintaining the profession of the gospel and opposing the corruptions of the Church of Rome. A million of poor Waldensians perished in France. 900,000 Orthodox Christians were slain in less than 30 years after the institution of the Order of the Jewets. Who's the current pope part of? The Jewish order. The Duke of Alvea boasted of having put to death in the Netherlands 36,000 by the hand of a common executioner in the, the space of a few years. The Inquisition destroyed by various tortures 150,000 within 30 years. These are a few special modes, and but a few of those which history has recorded but the total amount will never be known until the earth shall disclose her blood and no more cover her slain. This is the papal power has persecuted on numerous people who chose to follow the Bible and the word of God. Another quote here, to parry the force of this damaging testimony from all history, papists deny that the church has ever persecuted everyone, anyone. It has been the secular power. The church has only passed decision upon the question of heresy and then turned the offenders over to the civil power to be dealt with according to the pleasure of the secular court. The impious hypocrisy of this claim is transparent enough to make it an absolute insult to common sense. In those days of persecution, what was the secular power? Simply a tool in the hand of the church and under its control to do its bloody bidding. And when the church delivered its prisoner to the ex 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 executioners to be destroyed, with finished mockery, it made use of the following formula. And we do leave thee to the secular arm and to the power of the secular court, but at the same time do most earnestly beseech that the court so moderate its sentence as not to touch thy blood nor to put thy life in, other sort of, in any sort of danger. And then, as intended, the unfortunate victims of popish hate were immediately executed. Persecuted the saints of the Most High. From the trumpet, from February 3, 2016, after 500 years, the anniversary of the Reformation, for the Pope aims to end the biggest split in Christendom, a development that would radically expand the prestige and reach of the Catholic Church. Pope Francis officially apologized for persecuting Protestants on January 25th, as he unveiled plans for a radical push for unity during the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. As the Bishop of Rome, you notice the title he uses, the Bishop of Rome, the papal phase of the Roman Empire, and pastor of the Catholic Church, I would like to invoke mercy and forgiveness for the non-evangelistic behavior of the Catholics towards Christians of other churches, he says. At the same time, I invite all Catholic brothers and sisters to forgive if today or in the past they have suffered offense by other Christians non-evangelistic behavior. It's an interesting euphemism for the massive violence unleashed in the wake of the Reformation. Modern scholars estimate 50 million died in the religious violence that followed in persecution, <coughs> counterfeiting, and religious wars, wars. There are other sources that estimate up to, up to 150 million people were murdered 
during the Reformation by the Catholic Church, by the papacy, by that papal power, by the little horn power. Those little horn power thinks to change times and laws. Let's look at the uh, catechism again. In the Converse Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, we read, which is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day is the answer. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea <clears throat> transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? The Church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the dead on Sunday and the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on Sunday. By what authority did the Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? The Church substituted Sunday for Saturday by the plenitude of that divine power which Jesus Christ bestowed upon her. That's the claim anyways. The Catholic Christian instructed, has the Catholic Church power to make any alterations in the commandments of God? Instead of the seventh day and other festivals appointed by the old law, the Church has prescribed Sundays and holy days to be set apart for God's worship. And these we are now obliged to keep in consequence of God's commandments instead of the ancient Sabbath. This is a uh, story that brings out um, some Catholic beliefs here. The writer says, my mother recently sent me an email from a friend who was being challenged by evangelical to reconsider her Catholicism. He claimed that the Catholic Church had previously admitted what he referred to as the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a agreement graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, Exodus 24. In order to keep the Catholic faithful in darkness as to the truth that they should not have statues in their churches. Despite appearances, we know Exodus 20 is not a prohibition against making any likeness of anything in a strict sense because we clearly see God either commanding or pra praising the making of images and statues in multiple biblical texts. We believe the Catholic, Catholic Church alone has the authority to give to God's people an authoritative list of the Ten Commandments. If people don't know, the Catholic Church has their own Bible where they eliminated the Second Commandment and divided the Tenth into two separate ones to make the Ten Commandments. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church does exactly that. At least, it gives us a list for a sure norm for us. It's interesting. Despite appearances, we know that Exodus 20 is not a prohibition against making any likeness of anything in a strict sense. It's like an article I read within the last year saying, one plus one plus one can equal one. Why not? The same mind thought. It says what it says, but it really doesn't mean that. Daniel 7, 27, 28. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High talking about when Christ receives his kingdom, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dom dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cog cognitation has much troubled me, my thinking much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. When does the little horn speak great things? This vision tells us. 
and I beheld till the, thorns, till the thrones were cast down, the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garments was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. The throne was like a fiery flame, and its wheels as a burning fire. And a firing stream issued and came forth from before him, and thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. I, I beheld then, after the judgment was set and the books were open, I beheld then, because the voice of the great words which the horn spake, and I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. We studied Daniel chapter 8, and in it was the 2300-day prophecy. And in that prophecy, it says that the beginning of the 2300 days started with the command to go and rebuild Jerusalem, which was given by Cyrus. You can look in the book of Ezra, chapter 1, was given by Cyrus. Cyrus gave them permission, commanded them to go back to Jerusalem, gave them funds, gave him you know, animals, and sent people there to do it. But unfortunately, it got stalled, it got delayed. And if you look at the chapter 8 of the book of Ezra, you can see where the people in Israel and Jerusalem are saying, we can't do anything, people won't let us do anything. And so they appealed to Artaxerxes, he was the king of Babylon at the time, or king of, of Medo-Persia at the time. And um, what did he do? He searched the records. And if you remember from the story of Daniel and the lion's den, that the law of Medes and Persians cannot be changed. So he searched the records and he found that command that Cyrus had given and he reinforced that command and sent more goods and more people to uh, Jerusalem to start the rebuild, to continue on with the rebuilding process. And this command was given in 457 BC. And that's the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy. And if you do your math, and remember there is no year zero, the end of that prophecy is 1844. So the 2300 day prophecy says that at the end of this prophecy shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This, this is a whole study by itself, but I'm just trying to briefly go over through this. The cleansing of the, of the sanctuary. Most people, most churches teach that the sanctuary is the earth and that the cleansing of the sanctuary will be when Christ comes again. But that's not what the prophecy refers to. It's talking about the sanctuary. Remember when Moses was giving the command to create the sanctuary and after they came out of Egypt? Create the temple? Well, that sanctuary was patterned after the true sanctuary in heaven, as Hebrew tells us. And in the religious services of the sanctuary, there is something called the Day of Atonement, where they cleanse the sanctuary of all the sins that have been sprinkled on the curtain, on the veil, during the year. And Hebrews tells us that with Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, this will only be done once. So in this scene in Daniel 7, we see that, that God is on his throne and judgment was set and the books were open. Well, if that started in 1844, we're in the period of judgment right now. And then when this great words of the horn, when this, this little horn speaks great words against the Most High, according to this prophecy, what happens next? Christ comes in the clouds of his Father to receive his kingdom and dominion. What well, we've learned from Luke that once he receives his kingdom, then he will return to this earth again. That should cause us to pause to consider the period of time that we're living in right now. I think I just went through the next several slides, but what happens after Daniel hears the little horn speak? And he comes, the son of a man comes to receive the kingdom 
and dominion and glory before the Ancient of Days, which is God himself, the Father of Christ. When is the little horn destroyed? And through his policy, he also caused craft to prosper in his hand, Daniel 8, 25. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hands. My clicker is not working. For much, and going to Daniel 2, compare that to Daniel 2, 45. It says, for as much as thou saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. And the great God hath made known to the king that shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So this little horn will be destroyed at the second coming of Christ. Do you see how we need to consider all these different prophecies in Daniel? how they all come together and give us more information about the complete picture of the history of the world. In the past, in the, in the time we live in today, and in the future. Is the little horn about ready to speak with policy and craft in the time we're living in right now? What do you know about current events in this world where we live in. Are you aware that Pope Francis is inviting world leaders and young people to come together to the Vatican on May 14, 2020 for an event called Reinventing the Global Educational Alliance? Sounds good. What is it about? Never before has there been such need to unite our efforts in a broad educational alliance to form mature individuals capable of overcoming division and antagonism and to restore the fabric of relationships for the sake of a more fraternal humanity. The most significant personalities in the world are invited to take part in the proposed initiative, political, cultural, and religious and in particular, the young people to whom the future belongs. The Vatican Statement says, the goal is to arouse an awareness and a wave of responsibility for the common good of humanity, starting from the young and reaching all people of goodwill. So if you don't agree with the Catholic Church and its teachings, you're not a person of goodwill. If you don't agree with what they're trying to do, you're not a mature individual capable of overcoming division and antagonism. Do you see how he set this up? If you don't agree with them, then you're not a good person. An alliance, in other words, between the Earth's inhabitants and our common home, which you are bound to care for and respect. Francis wrote, an alliance that generates peace, justice, and hospitality, hospitality among all peoples of the human family, as well as dialogue between religions. A statement from the congregation also says that the new educational pact will aim to heal three fractures affecting the world. We'll look at those in just a second. Does this sound really good? Don't we need this in the world of, of conflict, of hate, of division, whether it's politically, racial, religion, whatever? Look at the mess the world is in. Just currently, there's, there's fires out of control in Australia. People were pressed to the ocean side and into the ocean to escape the flames. I don't know if you're aware, the Philippines in the last week have had three earthquakes. We've had tornadoes in December in the United States. Look at the wars going on. Apparently one of the most persecuted people in the world right now is in the country of Venezuela. There's like over, I don't know, six to eight million people that have left the country because of all the persecution going on. 
It's just one thing after another. So, yes, the world, the world is more divided. Yes, the world physically is coming apart, as the Bible predicts, by the way. And so he's calling the world together to create unity, to solve all these problems. And these three fractures we're going to look at next. The first is that which separates reality, reality from transcendence. Wow. Transcendence. Let me give you a definition from Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Transcendence exceeds usual limits, surpassing, extended or lying beyond the limits of ordinary experience. In Catan philosophy, which apparently is the Catholic Church is against, uh, being beyond the limits of all possible experience and knowledge, being behind compre beyond comprehension, transcending the universe or material existence, un universally applicable or significant. So here, first, the first. Uh, Fracture is that which separates reality from transcendence. According to the Vatican, children should be introduced to total reality, including openness to transcendent, healing a vertical rift between man and the absolute. So what's this absolute? I had to look this stuff up. I don't understand what he's talking about. I still don't know that I do. In Christian theology, the absolute is conceived as being synonymous with, the, with, a, with or an essential attribute of God and is characterized by other natures of God, such as his love, truth, wisdom, existence, omnipresence, knowledge, power, and others. Absolute love, for example, denotes an unconditional love as opposed to conditional limited love. Likewise, they disappeared on me. Okay, um, let me find my spot here. Um, they're having to scroll because I have so much uh, in my notes here. Oh, thank you, Zach. Likewise, the absolute can also be understood as the ultimate being or the characteristic of it in other religious traditions. Now, there's also a different, more pagan interpretation of this. A pagan interpretation is the absolute is the sum of all being actual and potential. In monotheistic idealism, it serves as a concept for the unconditional reality, which is either the spiritual ground of all being or the whole of all of things considered as a spiritual unity. In philosophy, idealism is the group of metaphysical philosophies which assert that reality or reality as humans can know it is fundamentally mental, mentally constructed, or otherwise immaterial. See how he's, he's appealing to other religious views, to other people who have different thoughts about what God is or who God is and how that is to be attained. The second fracture, <clears throat> the pact should heal is horizontal between generations, cultures within the family, within people who bring different cultural visions and religions and were those who faced financial, social, and moral difficulties. <clears throat> As most of us have noticed that there's a huge push for social justice. Uh, the spreading out of financial resources, of physical resources, of everything's okay, do what you want, God is in you, and so on and so forth. All these things that are coming up in society that we, we see today. Let's look at this third fracture. <clears throat> the third fracture is between humanity and the environment. With the urgent need to create the conditions for ecological citizenship, that education, responsible austerity, grateful contemplation of the world and care for the fragility of the poor and the environment. Obviously, the world is coming apart at the seams.
huge cry in the world today for save the planet, <clears throat> for global warming, so on and so forth. So much so that teenagers are going against presidents. Movie stars are going over against uh, leaders of other world countries and saying, you need to do this. You're not doing enough. This fires that they're having in Australia, there's a woman that wouldn't shake the prime minister's hand who was visiting the areas because he wasn't doing enough. So what do you think may be proposed as a way to heal all these fractures? From our study of Bible prophecy so far, what do you think? A day that will restore the vertical rift between man and the absolute? A day that will restore the horizontal between generations, cultures, and within the family. A day that will create the conditions for ecological citizenship or rest for the earth. What day do you think that will be? Let's look at the book of Revelation to gain further perspective. Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. And don't be too concerned. This is my last two verses. Um, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its horns ten crowns, and upon its heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and the mouth as a mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Wait a minute. Isn't this the same prophecy in Daniel 7? But we're in Revelation. The difference is Daniel is looking ahead to the future. Here, John in Revelation, who is living in the time of the pagan phase of the Roman Empire, is looking back, and he sees... The beast in reverse order. He sees the leopard, and then the bear, and then the lion. And he's also looking ahead and looking at the dragon that gave this, this, this beast that has blasphemy in the name of God his authority and his seat and great authority. Unfortunately, we don't have time to look at this today. But next time, we'll look at the book of Revelation to see what other information we can find that will give us further information about Bible prophecy and the time that we're living in right now.